Wednesday we're going to talk about this about this so yoga mm -hmm. and you know these Great. things yeah, yeah. our yoga and you know the principle <coughs> of yoga will talk on Wednesday mm -hmm. but today we are going to focus more about the practitioners you know? Great. Good. So we can call them uh, tantric practitioners or Buddhist tantric practitioners or mm -hmm. yogis or yoginis, you know, mm -hmm. or lay practitioners. Yeah, yeah. So that's why you mentioned about Sarah Kando. Yeah, Sarah Kando. And yeah. she was a great uh, yogini. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, her life story is really amazing. And mm -hmm. actually, you know, when she was 15 years old, she escaped from her family and mm -hmm. then she went to Ngolo. Mm -hmm. And there she really started her spiritual journey and then uh, yeah then she became you know tertunma mm. and also a great uh, she became a great master and she mm. was highly respected by you know all lamas <coughs> and monks and monasteries and so mm. it's very amazing yeah yeah yeah, yeah it is amazing because often the female as you said is uh, the female masters are less respected less recognized uh, even if they're respected it's sort of done privately and mm -hmm. so their their life stories never have the kind of power uh, and influence that they should mm -hmm. so i think this is something wonderful that you've been also doing with your books like with karma mudra is to bring out sarah Kandra's, for example her teachings yeah, 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 on yeah. how to integrate because uh, yeah relationship i, I thought path. it's important you know when we talk about uh, karma mudra everybody think okay this is a practice for men or yogis mm -hmm. But in fact, also, it is a very important practice for yoginis. Mm. So that's when Sarah Kandra's Dharma, there was a, a, in Vajravarahi uh, Tantra, there's mm. a one section about, uh, you know, Karma Mudra, mm. which is great. Mm. So also my own <coughs> teacher, the Aningawa Jansen, mm -hmm. she's a nun, but then her root guru was Anilochin. Mm. So she had a dreadlock. Dread she was, yeah. Mm -hmm. We, yeah, everybody says she was the reincarnation of Maji Labdran. Mm -hmm. And probably she was the queen of the yoginis in Tibet, you know, mm. so in central Tibet. And then Sarah Kandra became famous in Amdo, northeastern Tibet. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's interesting. Yeah, they are both very, probably the most famous uh, tantric uh, masters mm. in last century. The female one tantric is, masters, exactly. Yeah. One was Sarah Kandra and one was Anilochin. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think because of their yoginis, that's why many people they didn't know about them, you know, mm. because they're very famous, like male <laughs> masters and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. yeah. And my teacher, when she was um, in her mom's belly, mm -hmm. when her mother was pregnant of her and they believed, you know, she was the tulku of uh, some lamas. And then when she was born, she was a baby girl. They said, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. You know, our master's reincarnation must be boys. Yeah. So they kind of refused. This was kind of a limited view. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Limited view. So I think in the Tibetan Buddhism in generally, we have this, um, how do you say, the monastic system and non-monastic tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so historically, if we look in the history, uh, you know, the first group, the yogic group was 25 disciples of mm -hmm. Pamasambhava. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that group was bigger than the monastic group. You know, mm -hmm. the first group of uh, monks are called the uh, Salmi Dun, means like seven monks. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the, how the monastic tradition started in Tibet. Right. Yeah. And then the yogis are like 25 of them. Right, more than uh, exactly. almost four times but as much. But then I think yeah. in Pamasambo's time, there are more, you know, the yogic mm -hmm. uh, group was spreading more and more but then mm -hmm. later it was changed completely you know yeah and then the, i think it became a yeah, political system and mm -hmm. uh, the monastic system i mean of course we have to be grateful where they preserved so much of the yeah. um the texts and the art and all of that was mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. through the monastic tradition but it really always seemed that the innovation the creative uh impulse to especially see you know in the whole terma the whole revealed treasures uh this is the way the tradition seemed always to be renewed. There was a fertility mm -hmm. and a yeah, yeah, creativity yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's through the yogi tradition. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you look in the pre-Buddhist, like a bone tradition in Bombos, mm. it seems that the historical most important masters are male, uh, you know, like yogic masters. Mm -hmm. But then later, you know, like it's become also more like monastic. Mm. I think the same way, like tantric teachings, uh, of course, we can say many of these uh, Buddhist tantras coming from Nalanda tradition. So mm -hmm. Nalanda was a Buddhist university. But then all 
80 Mahasiddhas, they're mm. all yogis, you know, yeah. they're all kind of lay practitioners, right? Exactly. Even like Naropa was a monk and he disrobed and he became a yogi, you yeah. know. So inspired eight, by a, a yogini, eight, of exactly, course. Exactly, inspired by yogini. So there are many like uh, 80 Mahasiddhas, but many of them, they have female teachers, yogini yes. teachers. Yeah. And so then later, the, you know, I think the yeah, Nalanda tradition monastic part was kind of strong. And it, it, it's interesting, you know, the kind of the cycle. Mm. Then the Tibet is, yeah, yogic part was the first in the beginning, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it became more monastic. Mm -hmm. And then the yogic community was kind of, uh, you know, kind of hidden. A little bit hidden. Yeah, but, a little bit hidden, yeah. yeah. But even as you say, when we look back at the earliest, like, of course, the whole monastic tradition coming from Nalanda, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then all of the early tantras, even from Guya Samaja and all, mm -hmm. were coming from Udiana. Udiana and exactly. Udiana, would they call it the land of the Dakinis. Yeah, so yeah, this, yeah, so yeah, in yeah. a sense, even we hear... It the, seems, uh, yeah, yeah, in Udiana, there are only like yogis. Yogis, yogis and yoginis. yoginis. yoginis and there was actually the fertility yeah, yeah. of the, the yogi yeah, yoginis yeah. together that the treasure treasures were revealed and so there was a kind of not just you know male or female uh, but actually the creative alliance between the yogis and the yoginis yeah, that yeah. led it seemed also to the, the flowering between these two yeah, yeah between you know these lineages that were mm -hmm. you know that prospered in tibet alongside the monastic tradition mm -hmm. and which i think you know have a longer you could say endurance outside of tibet because mm -hmm. the monastic tradition of nalanda is not really going to affect so many people in the contemporary world mm -hmm. but the inspiration and the practices of the yogi yogini traditions this has a kind of relevance even more more and more in the world today so i think this is what's exciting well yeah when we talk about today and what is really relevant today is uh, yeah so what do you think the Tibetan tantric, actually it's interesting, you know, Tibetan tantric Buddhism is kind of spreading mm. everywhere in the world. And uh, then there are yeah, different schools and some of them more like in the form of uh, monastic tradition, but many of them, they are kind of like yogic style. You know? It seems more the yogic style. Yeah, yeah. And even as you were saying, in, you know, in conversation, actually the most practitioners are more female than male even. Mm -hmm. So I think this is something, it's almost like a full circle. You know, if we look mm -hmm. at the origins mm -hmm. in the early part of the tantras when the, the role of the, femi the female was so important and the yogini. And then of course, we know all of the great tantra, the so-called yogini tantras, you know, the Anuttara yoga tantras, and mm -hmm. then the final phase of that being yogini tantras. And so the, f the, the role of the feminine in uh, uh, bringing out and expressing, embodying the wisdom Mm -hmm. uh, and that expanding into the world today, I think this is what's exciting. And I think with your work, because you know, it's it's, it's spreading the really original yogi yogini tradition uh, from the Tibetan Buddhist world, the tantric Buddhist world. But it's also so combined with the medical. And I think this is something that is so important in the world today. You know, unless we have our health, mm -hmm. then so yeah, many yeah, of these yeah. practices yeah. we can't actually really we'd have spent all our time trying to uh, fix our health, but if actually the health and vitality is at this optimal level, mm -hmm. then the spiritual realizations yeah. and the compassion become spontaneous. They're kind of an overflowing mm -hmm. from the state of vitality. And I think this is the beauty to so me. So yeah, one of the, the most important uh, Tibetan medical text is called the Jushi, Four Tantras. Mm -hmm. So many people, they have questioned why a medical text is called the Tantra, you know, mm -hmm. Tantras. Actually, the Tantra, it's an entire like a spiritual education system, very complex. Mm. So also including the medical science, mm. astrology, astronomy, geomancy, biology, you know, alchemy, chemistry, so many things are included. No? Mm. So that's why today when we say like, oh, you know, uh, Tantric Buddhism, of course, there's a big misunderstanding about Tantra. You know, Tantra is only the part of engaging, engagement of the sexuality and these things but in generally yeah i think we really should understand when we say tantra it includes so many things right mm. like geomancy mm. the study of the nature biology mm -hmm. and also the medical science mm -hmm. and also about the study of human body and all these things you know yeah and, and i think that's where it really can resonate so much with uh, the world today because even 
in, you know, here we are in Italy and the Renaissance was so much about the microcosm and the macrocosm, mm -hmm. in other words, the body mm -hmm. and the universe. Mm -hmm. And so much of the Tantra is really about working, you know, the expansion of our conscious awareness of the body mind is not something limited to the flesh and blood and bones, mm -hmm. but actually extending into the cosmos. So mm -hmm. in a certain sense, this uh, kind of vision, I think, is still, you know, a natural be part of the even the Western psyche, you know, we can understand how these practices are about dissolving the kind of limited view we have of, of our mind and yeah, body yeah. as being just limited to this uh, flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but actually expanding. We don't have actually limit. We have this mm -hmm. sort of infinite potential yeah, yeah. that nonetheless is kind of programmed to be mm -hmm. uh, kind of limited. But the de deprogramming uh, education of the tantras, I think, is really... Uh, yeah, yeah. So the really, really interesting relevant. thing is also when we say sutra and tantra, like monastic tradition and the lay people or yogic tradition, mm. the interesting thing is in Tibetan Buddhism is known as Ndonga Songju, you know, the combination of sutra and tantra. Mm. So then somehow all Tibetan monks and nuns, they are yogis too, or they are mm. tantric practitioners. Mm. Because, you know, externally, yes, they have monks vows and, you know, they have Vinaya, but internal, all their practices are tantric practices. Mm -hmm. So but, that's why it's interesting, you know, like, ex, like uh, how do you call it? The outfit is uh, more monastic, but mm -hmm. internally what they practice is tantra. Mm -hmm. So without the country dicting, that's why they call Dong of Songju, you know, right. the union of Sutra and Tantra. Mm -hmm. But so, they're practicing in a different way, would you say, with like a Jana Dakini as opposed to yeah, the yeah, Karma Dakini, Dakini and all the, you know, creation stage, completion stage, you know, mm -hmm. the, the inner path is the same path, mm. but externally they are, they are manifesting as monks, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm. celibates and so on. Right. But I think also it is important if the monastic group, it really stays like a pure monastic group. Mm -hmm. And then if you are tantric and you are purely like tantric, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why in Tibet we have this uh, Ngakpas, we call Gokar Changlo. Gokar Changlo mm -hmm. means long hair and mm -hmm. white dress. So mm -hmm. I tried yeah. to show you <laughs> external yeah. manifestation. Exactly. Changlo means long hair, Gokar right. means white dress. Right. And so that's why yeah, sometimes we call it white Sangha. You know? mm -hmm. So I think the, the preservation of the, you know, the mm -hmm. group in our external part is not that important, but also it's it important. Yeah. Yeah. It has a continuation. You know? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes it seems to me like whether it's in Tibet or Bhutan that one doesn't, it's not as visible, you know, the, 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 the white, mm -hmm. you could say the white Sangha becomes more hidden. And sometimes even in, you know, in Bhutan, we see even there's a white Sangha, but they're still wearing yeah. gloves of Hmong because it just sort of fits into the culture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the confusing part, yeah. you know, like. And it Mongolia, confuses people. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. In Mongolia, there are many monks. Actually, mm. they are not celibate, you know. Mm. They, they put monks dress, but they have mm. family. Yeah. Same way in Bhutan, yeah. in Nepal. Or even in Japan with the yeah. Zen tradition. Yeah, yeah, Zen, yeah. 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 And uh, so especially some high position, the lamas, you know, they dress like a monk. Everybody thinks they're monks. Then, mm. then they find out their families, this and that. It's kind of a little bit confusing. Yeah. You know? okay. So that's why I think also, you know, what we call the white sangha, the yogic mm. community, and the red sangha, the monastic community. Mm. I think it's, it's good if there's a kind of clear separation. You know? I think so. I think everybody so will this can be yogis and mm -hmm. yogis can become monks right. right and it's our personal choice right right but they're kind of a different uh, approach yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. like lelong mm -hmm. the fifth lelong he was mm -hmm. a monk originally mm -hmm. and then later he was really much engaged tantric practices and karma mudra mm -hmm. then he said okay i want to change even physically you know i'm mm -hmm. not a monk anymore right but it's not he he gave up his practices. Mm -hmm. He's practicing everything. And right, but he expanded, exactly. you could say, which is the yeah, tantric yeah. idea. You just then, expand yeah, from... Yeah, long uh, hair, you know, his yeah. uh, robe was changed. I mm -hmm. think it's it's very nice. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because then it's clear for public. You are yogi or you are, you mm -hmm. know, monastic. Yeah, I remember he gave that beautiful description even of the sixth Dalai Lama, who was mm -hmm. the only Dalai Lama who actually gave back his monastic vows because he wanted to be a yogi and so there's that beautiful description of Lelum Shepe Dorji when he's young nah, at the yeah. Potala he wants to meet the sixth Dalai Lama he's actually a very young boy 
But then he gives this beautiful description of the sixth Dalai Lama coming up the steps of the Potala dressed in the blue robes with rings on his fingers yes. and long hair and his arch, you know, his bow and arrow. And he's so inspired, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. even they're drinking Chang and all, he just then the sixth Dalai Lama gives a kind of empowerment or ritual. Really and he just sees such focus, such clarity, such expansion. Mm -hmm. And he has, he said, I'm, you know, the devotion that he had for that time was just so great. And I think this is something where a very visible, you know, how the Sixth Dalai Lama manifested mm -hmm. his own yogic vows, not secretly dressed as a monk, but actually very visibly through mm -hmm. the long hair, yes, the yes, rings, yes. and the conch earrings, whatever yeah, yeah. it would have been. So, yeah, inspired today, people. Yeah. today it's a very confused time mm. <laughs> in many levels, you know, politically, spiritually, and there's so many confusions and informations and this and that. So mm. that's why I think in the when we talk about Tibetan Buddhism or Tantric Buddhism, I think also it is good in generally to have kind of clear presentation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The yogic group yeah. is yogic. There are yeah. many yogis and yoginis. And then monastic group is monastic. You know, there are many monks and nuns. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of clear, not really division, but clear presentation, I think mm -hmm. it's important. Yeah. You know? And I think, you know, like even when you look back at, you know, time of Atisha in Tibet, mm -hmm. like, you know, even 10th, 11th century, so early on, when even Tantra got a little bit out of hand, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a kind of too literal interpretation sometimes of the symbolic mm -hmm. coded text, then when Atisha came you know, to Western Tibet and you know, told him Saparang, and he said, actually, the third initiation, which is a very you know, the wisdom consort initiation said not appropriate for, for monks, those who have taken mm -hmm. vows of celibacy really shouldn't receive the third empowerment. Third empowerment. And but then, of course, for the monastic system had to kind of, you could say almost redefine, would you say the mm -hmm. third empowerment as a symbolic yes, yes, yes. kind of uh, wisdom as opposed to mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. ways it was presented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's how it was? Or yeah, 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 it's, you know, the it is interesting today, <clears throat> especially all over the world, you know, there are many, uh, how do you say, Buddhist centers, mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhist centers, and most of practitioners, they are kind of, you know, we call it Nakpa style, mm -hmm. it's a yogic style, yogis and yoginis. Mm -hmm. But in the yogis and yoginis, it's also not necessary, you really dress like a yogi or yogini, mm -hmm. you know. And you can be, we call it Bebe Nanjurpa. Bebe Nanjurpa means hidden yogis and hidden mm -hmm. yoginis, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can stay in normal your dress, mm -hmm. you know, normal your haircut, you mm -hmm. know. It's just normal in your work, uh, business suit, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can still, you know, receive empowerment, teaching and practice and mm -hmm. so on. So today in the West, we see kind of all Buddhist uh, centers and, you know, the practitioners, how functioning is actually is like, uh, yeah. It's the yogi culture, yogi yeah, tradition. It is, yeah, yeah like yeah. a hidden yogi. They uh, don't say it, and it is, you know. Yeah. So that's why I had this idea because Atisha, when he came to Tibet, you know, he ordained so many his disciples, mm. but his uh, heart disciple, Jom Dumba Jawe and Jone, said like a lay person, you know, Genyanpa, mm -hmm. lay person. So he had long hair, he had a white robe, and you know, this. So I often think like, okay. Atisha was really representing the, of course, he represents tantric Buddhism too, mm -hmm. but so much sutra part mm -hmm. and ethics, and then like uh, Vinaya, no? mm. the, the, the monks, yeah, the vows, dis discipline and discipline vows, uh... and these things. And then when he came to Tibet, like his uh, heart disciple stayed like a yogi, you know, mm. he said, you don't ordain, you stay like that. So yeah. I was really thinking, what was the reason? Yeah. And one thing is like you are saying, because Atisha, probably he gave many uh, Anuttara Yoga Tantra empowerment, and mm. then probably the heart disciple was the only one who, who could, could actually receive, receive it properly. And exactly. actually practice it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's one. Th Another thing I also thought is like kind of prophecy, you know. Mm -hmm. So Gadamba and later become Gelugpa, mm -hmm. and Gelugpa has become the most powerful monastic mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. But now the, how the Gelugpa spread the worldwide is there, uh, again, it's a yogic form, you know. Mm. There are so many, yeah, even there are so many like ex-monks, you know, now yeah. they are scholars, writers, yeah, researchers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were monks, but ex-monks, they, you know, they disrobe and they are kind of hidden yogis, you know, Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I thought that's a kind of like a 
very subtle prophecy too, you know, mm -hmm. like Kadamba is very monastic tradition mm -hmm. and then became Gelugpa. Yeah. And then somehow this school slowly, you know, transformed toward to the yogic True. part. Yeah. yeah, and it's a beautiful too, when we have great scholars like, you know, like Robert Thurman, you know, who Gelugpa mm -hmm. monk before, but now, you know, <laughs> yes, you could yes. say a total sort of yogi mm -hmm. manifestation, householder, yeah. and at the same time has that great academic discipline yeah, 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 yeah. that the tradition, mm -hmm. the scholastic tradition, the Nalanda tradition, mm -hmm. in a sense, provided. So it's wonderful that the yogi yogini tradition can have such a variation, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. within so, it. Uh, what do you think today, you know, I think in the West also there are some yogic groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like Tibetan tantric yogic yeah, groups. Definitely. So what do you think <laughs> about uh, yeah, the difference? You know, one we are saying, okay, there are many hidden yogis and yoginis. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, no? Yeah. Because there are many like tantric Buddhist practitioners, they just stay in their ordinary form, mm -hmm. but because they are practicing you know buddhist tantra and yoga and you know practices mm -hmm. so they are hidden yogis and sure. yoginis yeah and so that's for sure but then i think then some other groups they are also more externally presenting mm -hmm. they are really like the yogi tradition yeah. Yeah. as itself i think right? they're really supporting so what do you think about yeah actually it really groups. i admire it you know in a mm -hmm. way because i think it's which, also which groups like uh, well you think of aroter for mm -hmm. example in wales with nakochugim rinpoche you know mm -hmm they were following essentially the mm -hmm. um, direction of a great, you know, one of the great yogis who I also knew in Nepal, Kunsang Dorje Rinpoche. So he was a great disciple of Dujur Rinpoche, who was originally oh, okay. who I took refuge with. Mm -hmm. And when I was first in Nepal, so back in, I guess, early 1980s, I went to see Kunsang Dorje Rinpoche because I was very inspired. You know, he was the, you know, long haired, white robed, and I thought mm -hmm. really Nakpa style. I thought, okay, I'll, uh, you know, I, and, and a great Salung, you know, Tumo mm -hmm. master, that was what he was mm -hmm. famous for. And so, but, you know, he was very wrathful. <laughs> and, so, and in the way, the, the first assignment he gave me, I won't even go into, but I was a little, uh, I'm like, wasn't ready. <laughs> but anyway, what I really admire, so for example, not the Rinpoche, that's really, uh, and uh, Jagir Dorji and others who were with Konstant Dorji Rinpoche early on in Nepal, you know, he really asked them to, preserve this Nakba tradition in the West, meaning not just inwardly or secretly, mm -hmm. but actually through this sort of principle of drala, you know, this idea that, you know, what we wear and how we dress mm -hmm. and how we present okay. ourselves mm -hmm. has a certain kind of yogic uh, power, you could yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the Aroter, probably more than any other contemporary Western, uh, you know, Vajrayana tradition, you know, they have, you know, beautiful you know, the, the yogic belts, the, the clothing, the long hair, the conch earrings, they've really kept that tradition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, alive. So I think in that particular context as a upholding the white sangha, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've also taken vows where I'm never supposed to have cut my hair, but I've cheated, you know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to have it much longer and tied up. So but you want to hide. I'm hidden, not hiding. Just, hidden yogi. Just practical. So it's interesting, you know, in <laughs> Tibet, yeah, the yogi and yoginis, we call them Nenjurpa and Nenjurma. Mm. And then we use more the tantric practitioner or, you know, mantra practitioner, Ngapa mm. and Ngapma, mm. you know, mm. we use this word. But in Tibet, normally we use that word, Ngapas, you know, yes. Ngapas. Yeah. But then the yoginis, we are all kind of talk, calling them like a Kandroma, Dakinis. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that one part is good, you know, when you say Dakinis, they are like highly respected. Mm. But then the, the little bit sad part is, when you call somebody Dakini or, you know, it's a concert of a master mm. or mother or sister of, you know, some important master. So mm. they are called the kind of Dakini, you know, mm. that part is a little bit. Yeah, because it puts them in a it, sort of different Exactly, position. because they cannot come out like a Yogini or mm. Dakini by themselves, you know. Mm. It always kind of yeah, in relationship to something relationship, else. Yeah. yeah, relationship to the father, the yeah. family, yeah. or the brother, or the, the guru, husband, whatever, yeah. you know, that's the guru. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that part is a little bit sad. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's why uh, I think instead of uh, you know we focus much about the dakini kandroma, mm. I think the the um, the name of yogini is really nice. Yeah, I think so because there are so yeah. many practitioners. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they stay in the hidden form or non-hidden form. So yeah. yogini means like yoga practitioner, right? right? And it's so beautiful, and even in the Tibetan mm -hmm. language, you know, naljorma. Mm -hmm. So uh, naljor and uh, naljorpa, naljorma. But this idea of being unified with the natural state, 
really being the, the meaning of a yogi or yogini so that your whole lifestyle becomes a, a process of unification as opposed to a process of either transformation as in the tantras or even you know renunciation you know in the uh, theravada or early buddhism so it's this you know so using that term i think as you say yogini it's you're in a state of natural integration Mm -hmm. with your existence with your your body mind and and the outer phenomena the mm -hmm. outer elements so yeah i think it's actually more empowering in some way yeah uh, yeah. yeah and uh, yeah i think today <clears throat> you know uh, in tibet the yogic group are growing very fast you know mm. like in my hometown in amdo and repkong the yogic community is mm. really expanding mm. And also, there are so many female practitioners, mm -hmm. yoginis. Yeah. There are groups, uh, you know, they're everywhere. There are like many groups, and they're very serious practitioners. Mm. It, it's very, very interesting. It's know? beautiful to watch that in Tibet because, you know, originally, from what I would observe, if you were. Um... I think also the same in Bhutan, right? You Bhutan, go very I think often it's. it's Bhutan, yeah. So there are many like child practitioners. Yeah. So Chud seem to be like the, yeah. the you could say, the, oh, the gateway for mm -hmm. female practitioners who didn't want to become nuns, mm -hmm. but wanted to be serious practitioners. Then they became followers of Machid Lokdron, who herself was not a nun, mm -hmm. and Chud became their, you know, their practice, which is a very beautiful practice with, you know, outer, inner, and secret levels. But then that seemed to open up the possibility for female practitioners, very, you know, even to go on long retreat and other things without following the old model that had become almost uh, conventional in Bhutan of, okay, you cut off your hair, you become a nun and you go into retreat and that's your, that's your destiny. Path. But yeah, now I think there's true. more of an empowered um, female yoginis in Bhutan who are saying, I, I, all of this I want to do, but I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not about cutting my hair and they're inspired and as I know one in particular, you know, whose inspiration was Yeshe Sogyal, for example. Mm -hmm. So if we think of Yeshe Sogyal as the first enlightened Tibetan uh, yeah, disciple. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I call Yeshe Sogyal is the first Tibetan Buddha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, let's say in Nepal or India, the first Buddha was Buddha Shakyamuni. Yeah. And so then we call Bama Sambhava is the second Buddha. So mm -hmm. he was in Otiyana. Yeah. But then it, it's interesting when we talk the real, the first Buddha in Tibet. Yeah, you know. And mm -hmm. Yeshe Tsojil was the first Buddha. So first Buddha in Tibet was a female practitioner yeah. and was a yogini. Exactly. But what's amazing, how many we see hundreds, if not thousands of tankas or scroll paintings of life story of uh, Papa Sambhava. But we never see one tanka, one scroll painting of life story of Yeshe Tsojil. But her life story is amazing. Yes. So this is, again, just to show that there's been a kind of bias, let's say, towards the, the masculine side, which I think now can start to be slowly uh, balanced because the life story of, of Yeshe Sogyal and then the life story of Yeshe Sogyal and Padmasambhava together is mm -hmm. also an amazing story from there. Yeah, I think yeah. in generally, uh, you know, the tantric tradition itself, it's really tried to bring the social justice. Mm. So let's say in ancient time, Otiyana, we don't know, but mm. Otiyana, it seems really like they are talking about equality of male and female, mm. you know? Yeah, it seemed. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Because the females are called the Dakinis or mm. Yoginis and they're mm. highly respected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like entire enlightened society. Yeah. So in that enlightened society, there's no difference between male and, you know, mm. female and even including the third gender we call money. Yeah. yeah. But then, then in India, it seems it's, it was like many areas, you know, mm. it's very kind of male dominated. Mm. You know? So that's why in Tantra, it kind of really empowers the women, the female mm. practitioners, mm. you know, the yogini and the traditions like in the Indian Tantra, the form of Kali, you know, mm. she can manifest uh, mm -hmm. yeah. different forms. Yeah. And then in the Buddhist Tantra, we have Vajra Yogini, she like embodies the passion and wisdom mm. and then vajra varahi also kind of the force and yeah. energy yeah. and conquering you know yeah the life this, force yeah really. exactly yeah. the queen energy mm -hmm. and then even in the in the 14 you know uh it mm -hmm. means the 14 root vows samayas mm -hmm. yeah. one of these sherp the 14 the last one says sherp the chapume lamo parmacha so you know, women are representing the wisdom, mm. so don't uh, discriminate yeah. them, don't mm. against them, right? Mm. So they put this in the Samaya, in the 
kind of like end of rule. Yeah. So that's tantric why, vows. Exactly. Tantric mm. vows. So it's kind of really like a great support for women. You mm. know? So that's why I'm saying wherever Tantra was started, it mm. brings kind of like social justice. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The, the, the harmony and equanimity between men and women mm. is like solar and lunar energy. We need mm -hmm. to balance, you know, mm. fire and water, mm. hot and cold and these things. And, um, but even though still, I think maybe Tibetan society was not that heavy, you know, compared to some Indian society, mm -hmm. ancient one. Mm. But I think also still in Tibetan society, we had that, you know, mm. it's a kind of male dominant society. Yeah. So that's why, you know, the old Tulkus reincarnated the masters, uh, male masters, yeah. and all abbots of monasteries are male, you know. For the most part, yeah. yeah you yeah, had the most... Sanding, Doji Palmo, yeah. and a few yeah, other. Yeah, very, very, very few. Very, very few, yeah. Yeah, 99%. 99%. Like, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why I think one of the tantric goal is really bringing this kind of balance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny going back to Udiana. So if we look at Udiana as being support, you know, kind of, you could say the birthplace of the Buddhist tantras, according to the later stories, it was where Guya Samaja, for example, the first of the great tantras was mm -hmm. disseminated, you know, to the king, you know, Indrabhuti, who had requested a path to enlightenment that meant he did not have to give up his worldly uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. requirements, you know, so according to that story, you know, he, he was so inspired mm -hmm. by all these arhats, you know, flying through the sky and, but he said, you know, I want a path that is, uh, you know, where I can integrate my worldly responsibilities. Exactly. Uh, and, and as a result, according to one of the stories, you know, the whole court became enlightened. The whole court was like a mandala. And so the whole enlightenment. But then what's beautiful about that story, when you look at Lakshminkara, who is considered to be, according to some accounts, the sister of Indra Bhuti, mm -hmm. who was the king of Udiana. Mm -hmm. So one of the earliest tantra, uh, texts is the, um, mm -hmm. is the um, uh, writings of uh, Lakshminkara are relatively less known. But according to her own autobiography, she was explaining that she was actually the guru of her own brother, uh, oh, oh, Indra Bhuti. And in that particular text, it's amazing because she describes actually a lineage in Udiana, going back, I forget, five or nine different lineage holders of actually the, um, the Advaya Siddhi, you know, the, the accomplishment of non-duality of actually mm. appearing. So she taught this to Indra Bhuti, who then wrote his own Sahaja Siddhi. But then before that, she's describing this lineage as having been both male and female mm -hmm. practitioners. So already we see that there was a yogi yogini uh, tr held tradition uh, in Udiana prior to Indra Bhuti, who of course is considered to be like the foster father, if you will, of, uh, mm -hmm. of Pamasambhava. So even right at that very mm -hmm. heart of the tradition, this yoga culture that uh, Pamasambhava himself emerged out of was already this tradition of yogini masters as well yeah, as yogis. Lechewamo. Lechewamo yeah. is like the, the queen of karma. This one of Pamasambhava's teacher was a mm. yogini. Right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, same thing also Yuto Nyingti, the Yuto's uh, main root guru, the main master was uh, mm -hmm. uh, Shirimala, Kandroma, mm -hmm. Kandroma Palden Tingwa. He's another mm -hmm. yogini. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those stories. So in the Western culture, how do you say? There's always a great woman behind a great there's woman. Always, oh, yeah. the, how uh, do you say it? The, how does it go? The, uh, behind every great man, there's always, there's a greater woman. <laughs> That's the so, Western proverb. But in the applies. <laughs> tantric Buddhism, <laughs> yeah. it seems like all great masters yeah. and they have a great female guru. Yeah. Like look at, like we think mm -hmm. of Kagyu tradition of Tilopa, who was the teacher mm -hmm. of Naropa. But then we, according to different accounts, he received this whole transmission of the six yogas from either Vajradhara, a kind of cosmic Buddha, yes, but yes, yes. on a more relative level, he supposedly received it from a Dakini from Udiana. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was he got the prophecy to go to, to uh, Udiana to receive the teachings. Well, from... I think Telopa's teacher was a prostitute, right? Well, there's also that account that he, or he, <laughs> else he was her servant for <laughs> right. a while, yeah. yeah, one yeah. Of the, prostitute, uh, and as you, well as... you call it the pimp, right? Pimp. Yeah, he was can a, be a female pimp. The nicer way I think that they put it is a procurer. <laughs> <laughs> procurer. So he brought he brought clients. <laughs> uh -huh, okay, yeah, yeah, that was. You One see, account. that's yeah. why. Yeah. Also, the, you know, that that really like tantric teaching is not kind of uh, inclusive for some group of people. Yeah. So actually, you know, 
yeah. without any discriminations, you know, mm. you're a male or female and poor or rich, it really went everywhere, right? Yeah. And I feel like that story, for example, was just meant to kind of shock us out of any kind of idea that of sacred and profane of samsara mm -hmm. nirvana as having some kind of harsh di dividing line. It's really what mm -hmm. kind of, and of course those stories, you know, is you know the pure compassion and which can be brought into any kind of field of activity. So, you know, we might have a kind of negative view of prostitution, for example, now that might have been different from how the stories were told, you know, back in the eighth to tenth century, where the idea was it just this was a path of integration, <laughs> compassion. Well, and, today you say, oh, you know. I'm practicing Tantra and my lineage is from a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people might sort of roll their eyes. <laughs> but he was also, he, he was a tahini maker too. Of course, he was yeah, yeah, pounding yeah. Uh, yeah, sesame yeah. seeds. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the point was that whatever it is in life that we do, that itself can become the path to our realization. It's not like we have to give up some kind of worldly job or worldly profession in order to become spiritual. It's about finding a new vision mm -hmm. uh, and a new approach to whatever it is we're doing in life. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really the, so much what these Mahasiddha stories, whether they're the male or the female mm -hmm. Mahasiddha, they sort mm -hmm. of show us. Like Saraha, for example, who's like the, mm -hmm. you know, the grandfather, if you will, of the Mahasiddhas, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. with an arrow mm -hmm. smith. And he, he was yeah, a monk, you know, but then he mm -hmm. said only after he started to living together with the Arab Smith's daughter. He said, only now am I truly a monk. Mm -hmm. In yeah. other words, only now do I truly understand the, yeah, yeah. the Actually, teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, yeah, there's the experience uh, directly. I think uh, Chakra Samvara Tantra, it says, uh, when you receive the first empowerment, you are Genyan, mm. like, and mm. then second empowerment is a Getsu. Mm. Third one is a Gelung. That's mm. the highest of monk. Uh, yeah. um, ordination right and then the fourth empowerment then you become a Nakba. okay so actually it's 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 interesting the way it says you know like each empowerment goes mm. a higher level but the highest level is a yogi yeah and <laughs> ironic that then, the third then, empowerment connected to the, the gelong which the, is actually breaking the vows exactly so, so then you become like yeah yeah so playing with mm -hmm. the whole inversion but i that. think also yeah the, it's interesting because in tibetan history especially like from last century, you know, in last century, mm -hmm. there's so many great masters. Mm -hmm. And when they are young, they are monks, you know, mm -hmm. they're ordained and they're trained in monasteries mm -hmm. and later they disrobed. Mm -hmm. So in Tibetan culture, when you disrobed, it's called the Talok, you know, mm -hmm. like you're against the Chaba, it's like kind of considered something negative. No, but many getting... masters are like that, you know. They graduate. Including the Panchin Lama, you know, yeah. the latest one. Yeah, so exactly. he was a monk and then he been to the prison and mm -hmm. then then he had a family, he had his daughter. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then there's so many, I think also like Chujam Jongpa Rinpoche, right? Yeah, so of course he was, he was a, a monk in Tibet and, and, and then he came out. But, and uh, then he was become kind of founder of the, I don't know, some people saying he was the founder of the Tibetan Buddhism in US. You could almost say like that. He was yeah, certainly one of the greatest like figures of yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Tibetan Buddhism in But But it seems that he didn't focus much on the yogic culture, right? He focused, I think, well, he definitely he focused. He didn't emphasize much, maybe. He didn't I emphasize the monastic culture at all. Ah, he, okay. But he emphasized, ah. he emphasized, but his kind of yogic style was, as you know, he kind of dressed in kind of three-piece suits sometimes. You know, So he had a different kind of interpretation of uh, so very, integration. Very Western style of yogis. I think he yogis. was trying, I mean, from what I understood, because what I met Chögyam Trungpa, like, in, after I came back from Nepal in the 1970s, mm -hmm. I went out to uh, Boulder, Colorado when he was there. And that time I'm, have hair as long as you <laughs> and they all well you look very young but it seems <laughs> we can't guess your age well you know, we don't this, even want to talk about all this great, we won't talk about that you met all of them great masters but the point was then you know it was like uh, i was also shocked i'd come from nepal but then in uh, the sangha chicken chungpa because that was really the height of the whole hippie era you could say in the west and i think what he was trying to do uh, was to introduce not just discipline uh, mm -hmm. within his Sangha, but also to introduce, um, in a certain sense, not about a rejection of your, like the Mahasiddha tradition, don't mm -hmm. reject who you are, what you are, what your own cultural traditions are, you know, wear them with honor. So he would sort of model that by wearing these sort of saddle row suits made in London and sort of showing the high, so rather than dry, dry, uh, dressing in kind of, Tibetan style. He didn't mm. do that at all. He dressed in a kind of high Western mm. fashion. And so I think it was partly just to 
uh, you know, in a way to work skillfully with um, a period of so great expansion in Western culture. Like easy to integrate. In easy society. to integrate. And I think a lot of that's what he was showing was about integration, not rejecting, not accepting. It was about, you know, just celebrating. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, Trumpa Rimshu was Smoking and drinking. And he's smoking and drinking <laughs> and more. He did a lot more than that too. Yeah. But uh, it was, you know, in his own way, he was really like a siddha in terms mm. of his activity yeah, 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 and his action. And mm. I think that's what he was showing was you don't have to reject anything. You just have to do everything with awareness and with com mostly with compassion. And I think this tukche is the most, mm -hmm. when we talk about continuity as being or lineage as being, the real meaning, the root meaning of Tantra in you, mm -hmm. Ju, as you, Jut, yeah, yeah. but really part of that is what is it that lineage, that continuity, we sometimes say it's the, you know, it's the continuity, but it's the, of not just enlightened awareness, but it's of this compassion. And when this heart, and when you bring compassion into every action and actually every activity, then nothing is impure, you know, mm -hmm. because if it's done with pure intention, with pure results, and it brings more and more, you know, joy and, and uh, satisfaction and awareness and vitality mm -hmm. to the world, mm -hmm. then, um, then the kind of contraction model, you could say of, you know, more and more vows, more and more restrictions, mm -hmm. more and more limitation. This was a kind of different approach, I think, uh, that the, the Yogi Yogini tradition is. It's like expand according to your capacity. If, if it becomes confusing, then you, you know, just to go back to, you know, when I first met the Chatur Rinpoche and he sort of Put me in the first retreat you know he sent me up to uh, to a cave for a month and in yolmo right that was in yolmo so it was a hidden land in uh, well, no, north of Kathmandu, land. and you know it was very interesting he said you know what's the practice he gave and then so i came back and um then i you know i was so inspired by you know what had happened as a result of intensive month of meditation actually i stayed longer i stayed six weeks and i said mm -hmm. oh you know Prashay, should i like become a monk in this life because he looked at me like why would you want to become a monk Oh, really? Yeah, he said that literally. He said, "Why?" You and he said, and I said, "Oh, Rimsha, I should become like, um, like a, you know, an Akpa." Mm -hmm. No, he said, <laughs> he said, follow the example of the Siddhas. Is really what he said. Oh, really? Yeah, he yeah. absolutely said. He said, actually, follow example of Indrabuti. He said, "Sangwan Ultra." He said, ah, so he said, yeah. so he said, this is like, like a, a hidden, secret yogi. like a secret yogi. In other words, there's nothing that you outwardly, once you actually know the pointing out, you know the nature of the mind, you know yeah, the nature yeah, yeah. of. Things there's actually to, to important no, is to get the essence of the teacher. for the essence, yeah, yeah. and then as we know, even like in you know with Tindin Orberum Shay and all of that, you know, who was very much integrated, you know, so the son, heart son of uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think it, many of those great masters, you know, like uh, who are the leaders of the yeah big uh, Buddhist uh, groups, mm. you know, internationally or mm. worldwide, many of them they are like yogis. Mm. But uh, it seems they did not focus on the external part of, you know, no. the presentation much, right? Like no. Chujam Jumba didn't right. focus much. Yeah. And also Sogya Rinpoche, he didn't he just, focus yeah, much. He, yeah, he had his own sort of dress style. No, he had, but yeah. he didn't ask his he students. He didn't ask his yeah, students yeah, exactly. to dress any kind of freestyle. Yeah, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And with like Tukutini Nobu Rinpoche, for example, mm -hmm. Tungsi Rinpoche, he, he was very interesting because it was also very freestyle, but he said, you always some wear something red, <laughs> white and red. So subtly, you know, you can do uh, white and red. White uh, and red. But so he said, and particularly in some context, so it's kind of subtle. It was very subtle. So he said, normally anything, but for example, yeah. if you're in a, you know, you're receiving Wong or you're something you might be presenting teaching, then white and red is still very symbolically important, but it doesn't have to be like a Tibetan, you know, shirt. You know, mm -hmm. So it can be just subtle. Well, I think. <laughs> I'm not making publicity, but Tibetan shirts can be a new design too. You know? I think they're fantastic. Yeah, they're actually, yeah, yeah. I used to wear. <laughs> actually, one of our yeah Spanish uh, friend designed. This it's, is a, it's, very, it's a yeah. bit, very, very practical. Very thing. practical and much more chic. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, here I am in a very conventional <laughs> Oxford cloth shirt. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. But no, well, but, I used to when I was in Lhasa, you know, in like 19 early 1990s. Mm. And I always, you know, like I was in love with this Ngakpa culture. Mm. And, you know, I had, of course, I had teachers, you know, monks, geshes, and then my Anila, the mm. nun. But my personally, I was so much focusing on this, how to like, 
presenting upper culture. Yeah, you know, embody that's like that, yeah, yeah embody that. Yeah, you know, like yeah. to have long hair yeah. and you know the earrings. Mm -hmm. And ring is like kind of Andrabodi. Beautiful. Andrabodi was a king. I yeah, was yeah. a student, college student. No, but it's still but like. I a... really had so much that kind of like something, a kind of a hunger, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then this my Geshe teacher, he said, the tantra, you know, you can just put to practice, you know, it's something, it's an inner quality, yeah. not external. Yeah. Then I was saying, well, also external, yeah. I need to show this. I had so much. But I think that's Drala, no? Isn't you, this principle of yeah. Drala, of just mm -hmm. the, you know, presenting it that mm -hmm. way, it also helps to embody the attitude, mm -hmm. there's an attitude that goes with it and an orientation towards life and experience that, you know, that when you're, you know, dressing that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we to... should uh, find a balance, you know? Mm. I think also like when you say, okay, it is a yogic culture, it's like that, that you mm -hmm. can ignore it, you know, mm -hmm. maybe also kind of extreme. Yeah. And also when you say you have to dress this and that, you know, too many rules about that, that's mm -hmm. another extreme. Yeah. So that's, I think it's, you know, we need to balance, you know, yeah. kind of the middle way. Yeah. Know? And I also, I think it just according to circumstances yeah, yeah, and exactly. situation you adapt. And that mm -hmm. I think is the skillful means of the yogi yeah, yeah, yogini yeah, yeah. to, you know, when you're going mm -hmm. to, there's not like one style you bring to every occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you might be going to a wong to an yeah, initiation. Yeah, yeah. You're so going I was, to. Yeah, I was thinking going, today, going to like the, the shell, you know, mm -hmm. you have many different kinds of shells, a mm -hmm. scarf, larger mm -hmm. scarf or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe in the Tibetan yogic tradition, mm -hmm. at least a kind of like symbolic robe. Beautiful. Yeah. Maybe just the, 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 the robe. White and the, the red, zen, the zen, the, the red. Zen, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that's a kind of uh, how do you say, not extreme way, but in a kind of symbolic way. Yeah, and I think they can actually give a certain kind of um, yeah, 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 kind of self empowerment in a positive then way. Then also, yeah. when you say, oh, you know, like I'm a, like a hidden yogi, I yeah. don't need to change. Again, it's kind of extreme. You know, I don't need. I know this, this also I, like a rejection. You know, exactly, is kind of always a rejecting, yeah, yeah. and then something like this. No, no. And also, I think it's the Guru Bama Sambhava give that name. You know, mm. right? Kukar Changlo, mm. white robe and long hair. Yeah, yeah. Long hair. Let's say, okay, you know, if you maybe if you live in this society sometimes you need to cut your hair whatever or your style in any way in any case the hair regrows you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you are bold yeah and it's easy but i think the the close part at least like uh, how do you say presenting that Nakpa mm. community or the culture yeah, yeah. so i was thinking it's good because i received this from my teacher the nun mm. you know, and mm. beautiful so that's why is it pure cotton or is this, this material? Linen, linen. Oh, linen. Yeah. Beautiful. Linen, oh, yeah. Linen. This Very one, nice. well, somebody somebody made in France. Ah. So it's, it's a beautiful. Very, very nice. You know, so that's why I was thinking, yeah. Also, you know, some group, they really kind of reject the Ngakpa, mm. you know, no, this dress. Is and extremism. Do, yeah, exactly. Mm. That's uh, extreme. And then other one is like, you have to have so many things. You know, mm. of course, in tantric texts, you know, once you receive empowerment and you have to hold the instrument of all your deities and so on, it's mm -hmm. too complex. You know? yeah. So that's why at least uh, we call it this also Tenjel Lula Digna Tokpa Semlachar. You know, like you have symbolic clothes, symbolic mm -hmm. hair, and you know, that brings the how do you say realization in your yeah, mind? It brings some. It has a kind of magnetic quality. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. realization in the mind, and this mm. is a very how do you say very specific thing up teaching. Mm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was talking about Tibetan upper culture by myself. I think you saw my video. Yeah, I was saying this three machu machu pasum, or sometimes they say machu pashi. So lu machu. Uh, Rawa Changlo means like you don't change your body. So right. the, your long hair is the symbol for that. Right. And then Ku uh, Machu Kukar Changlo. So you don't change your clothes. Actually, you know, ancient time, the walls yeah. and the cottons are kind of white or maybe a little bit brownish. Yeah. yeah. It's, Un it's undyed, you could say. Un yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Undyed. Natural color. Yeah. Natural color. So that's the clothes. And the body. You know, like keep unchanged nature, mm. close, keep unchanged nature. Mm. And then uh, even the, the bowl, you know. Did mm. you read this Jujam Dromba's book? 
the, the, the sc skull cup and the exactly yeah, the, the, tea, the tea cup, cup and the skull tea cup, cup and skull cup yeah. exactly that, yeah. I like that title because yeah. that's exact says you know because each you, one a different Buddhist culture exactly. was represented yeah, by yeah. a different if you kind are of Zen, vessel if you had Zen this tea cup you that's know so you, much symbolic exactly quality. you kind of beautiful lots of warmth. Mm -hmm. So if you are kind of Tantra skull cup, it's a natural. Yeah. Know? In other words, fearless and integration of yeah, normally yeah, yeah. what people would be or, yeah, yeah. It's, propelled it's by, like, you yeah. embrace it. Yeah. it. It exactly, it's a skull yeah. cup. So that's why it's in this is the Porma Chubanda Chamba means mm -hmm. your skull is not something you you made it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's something up it created by itself. That's skull, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this and then so these three things, like you have the skull cup and you have white robe and long hair. Mm -hmm. So three of them more like external symbols. Mm. But these three things will help your mind. Same much you need much So then you keep your mind as it is, you know, yeah. original, yeah. organic version. Yeah. So that to refer to Rigpa or whatever, you know. Yeah. So no, I think it's very, very, you know, it's powerful. It's like in any field of activity, you know, people go into a corporate life and they're dressed in a suit and tie they have a certain presence that mm -hmm. it gives them in that field of activity you know if you're in you know if you're a sailor on a ship you know you you're where yes, yeah, and then yeah, you, yeah, then yeah. you feel like you're this is your culture exactly it's like you feel you can function more yeah, yeah, skillfully yeah, yeah. Exactly. if you're dressed for the the role you could yeah, say. yeah 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 exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah, good it's yeah in western like culture we have this yeah, we have a uniform basically uniform yeah, yeah and then exactly. you this is like your who so you that's are. why yeah monks they have the ropes yeah. there is a uniform, uniform right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's why yogis we have a uni. We need a uniform too. Yeah, I think so. And it's skillful. It's it, not like a limitation. It yeah, doesn't yeah, have yeah. to be used all the time. But then when it is worn, it gives the sense of a of a presence. And yeah, yeah. It presence. gives reminding. Everything reminds you. Reminder, exactly. Yeah, a reminder of who and what you are and how yeah, you yeah, actually yeah. relate to reality. So I think very skillful. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it's just too free form, then you know, even just subtle. Shuttle things like that, little pieces. This is yeah, actually how yeah. Tukutin the Norbrim Shaykh used to teach. You know, mm -hmm. even he would show sometimes have a little ah, red yeah, yeah, thing yeah. underneath his white. You know, it was just always as a kind of uh, subtle. You know, one would even notice unless it was pointed out. And I thought that was quite, quite unique. You know, his particular yeah, 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 approach. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. yeah, yeah. I think also in the Tibetan itself, we have this little bit confusion. You know, when you say Ngakpas. Mm. So in Amdo, when you say Ngakpa or Ngakma, it's kind of clear. Mm -hmm. And then in Karjopa, sometimes they don't say Ngakpa, they say Tordenpa, you know. Mm. Yeah. Torden means with visual uh, realization, yeah. but still externally, you know, you have Kukar Changlo, you know, you have the dreadlock, yes. and white yeah. robe. It's yeah. the same thing, you know, they are yeah. Ngakpas too. Yeah. But and then some people, they say, oh, we're not Ngakpas, we're Jopas, you know, we practice mm -hmm. Jop. Yeah. And then some people, they say, oh, we are, you know, not uh, Ngakpas, we are just uh, tantric, this and that. Mm -hmm. I think there's this kind of, you know, yeah, like yogis and yoginis, this, there is this kind of confusion too. Mm. Because at end, you call Ngakpas or Chepa or Torden, yogis, yoginis, it's always the same, you know, yeah. right? We are yeah. all tantric practitioners. Mm -hmm. Buddhist tantric practitioners, and then we just have different names. Yeah. But at end, we all practice yoga. Yeah. You know, yeah. we are our guru yoga. Yeah. So all schools representing yoga, and if we practice guru yoga, then we have to be a yogi and yogi. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But yeah, all these terms, and then some people would just say they were dzogchenpas, you know, so they were <laughs> yeah. just practicing the ultimate state of integration without any reliance on even salong chuk or anything, <laughs> and just integrating with uh, with all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, I think when you say, oh, I'm not this one, nor that one. It's also rejection and it's also limitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then also creates more confusion. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I think this is exactly how Chatur Rinpoche always would explain. Dzogchen people said really misunderstand. It's not a path. Dzogchen is actually the state of realization, but you get it from all these other methods. Mm -hmm. So he said, um, you know, when people try to fly too high, then they, they, um, they actually you lose all of the skillful means that are there to actually bring about that, mm -hmm. that realization. Yeah, Dzogba Chembo, if you really talk about Dzogba Chembo, it should be all inclusive, yeah. not exclusive. Exactly, exactly. But you say, I'm Dzogba, I'm Dzogchen practitioner. Then you're already I'm, making exactly, some kind I'm, of limitation. You know, like, 
exclusive that already is a kind of limitation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like an elite force. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that's why the middle path, you know, it's, it's yeah. I think it's very, very important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. not a middle path that excludes the, the sides, but actually that can dance between mm -hmm. the extremes and integrate. Mm -hmm. um, but always at the same time, yeah, honoring mm -hmm. that. So that yeah, you you have been practicing tantric Buddhism like since so many years. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say how it many won't years. Count. <laughs> and then you wrote uh, beautiful books, you know, this uh, Tibetan yoga principle and practice. We'll mm -hmm. talk on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We'll have a meeting yeah. about that. Okay. And we talk to practices, and today we are talking about practitioners. Yeah, but that, mm. what is your like personal view about uh, yogis and yoginis in Tibetan Buddhism in general? Okay, well, just as I, I suppose as a prelude to what we'll talk about later. Uh, so in this book, for example, I thought it's so important when I when you look into the history that behind, as you said, behind every great Mahasiddha, there was a greater Mahas, you know, a female Mahasiddha, like even Virupa, he went into mm, what, nine years great. of meditation, and the yogini was making his radish soup. And, you know, he mm -hmm. first thing he wanted, and, you know, yeah, so yeah. her realization was greater than his, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So what I really wanted to emphasize in this book, which is really to, I think, for the, for the first time to really show what the depth behind the so called six yogas behind the physical practices within tantric buddhism which tend to get when we look historically what's happened in the west so much more emphasis was put on kirim on the creation phase development phase on visualization and on uh, you know uh, what i really wanted to emphasize in this book was the the, the completion phases mm -hmm. so in other words looking at where, yeah. the, where the mandala is brought into the body and we work with the energies and qualities of our own microcosm we work as I say, so in terms of yogis and yoginis, what I really wanted to emphasize in the book, so on the cover, for example, is a female siddha, a female practitioner from a 14th century um, wall painting from Western Tibet. So that was just to kind and of- And from which monastery, do you know? This is from Toling Monastery. Ah, Toling. Toling in, uh, in West Tibet. So mm -hmm. very rare to see a, a yogini uh, shown meditating in nature with animals and trees. And so throughout the book, I really sought out female practitioners in Tibet and Bhutan. And I really tried to uh, give real emphasis to that because I thought it was kind of a missing side of the tradition. And there's some great, you know, kind of hidden yoginis in the, in the Tibetan Buddhist world, whether they're in Bhutan or Tibet, but also, also, of course, many yogis. But what this book really tries to give emphasis to is the non-monastic transmission of these practices and how those have been uh you know origin originated from Udiana, let's say right mm -hmm. up into contemporary society um so that's really what i tried to give emphasis to um and again to show the dynamic between the uh between the male and the female because again it's not just like um it's like for example i wanted to ask you dr nita about the you know, you see some Western uh, nuns, actually, mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhist nuns who have really fought hard for Tibetan nuns to get the same level of ordination as West, as, um, as Tibetan as nuns. Monks, monks. But yes, sometimes yes. I feel like they're just pushing to join a men's club. You know, it's like mm -hmm. there's a men's club that had its own rules and regulations that were actually made for male practitioners. Why not actually just instead of maybe there could be some real visionary and uh, something even higher that's more yeah. relevant for today's world yeah where you're not limiting those young nuns into mm -hmm. a system that was essentially for over two thousand years it was basically a, a men's club yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> why, that's, why? yeah seems yeah, a little yeah, bit like i'm surprised you yeah know? no that's true also the the thing is when you look in the tibetan term terminology mm. so there is a gelung Mm. means that's the highest order in the monk mm. and then there is no gelungma that's yeah, the problem okay. mm. so they they are kind of they are saying they wanted to have gelungma mm. i mm. think now they have it mm. and also the geshe degree mm. so basically when you become geshe is like you become a professor yeah so this is a chance only for the monks not mm. for the nuns right. and that content you know in that uh aspect I can understand them. Mm -hmm. You know, like today in the universities, there are male professors and female professors. Yeah. There are male mm -hmm. doc, you know, doctors, female mm -hmm. doctors. Yeah. I think in that way back. also, yeah, yeah. I think it's good, you know, there are mm -hmm. a few Geshe Mas now mm -hmm. and they're great mm -hmm. teachers. Yeah. 
and for my personal um, experience is uh, I have a nun, you know, Annie Ngao Jensen is my mm. nun teacher. Mm. I had a very special relation with her because mm. for me, she is my spiritual mother, my mm. teacher, mm. and she was very strict on me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was kind of always scared of her, but mm. also I loved her. Yeah. And the way how she taught and the way how she think about you, it's a little bit different than other male masters. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she had that kind of like maternal love. You mm. know? Even you are doing something bad, even you have a bad um, uh, uh, reputation. Mm. She doesn't care, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she saw me as a, her disciple, as a son. Mm. You know, you are mm. good or bad is not important. You know, mm. there's a kind of uh, a love without a judgment, you know, beyond yeah. a judgment. Yeah. And then, uh, so you met at Dinjo Rinpoche. I yeah. didn't meet personally yeah. to yeah. Dinjo Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. That's, I think I'm too young. Yeah. <laughs> True. And, uh, but Dinjo Rinpoche's daughter, yeah. Chenle Norbu Rinpoche's uh, sister, yeah. Dechin Yudun was my teacher. You Wonderful. Know? I received the Truman of Mo mm. teachings. Mm. And uh, Dechin Yudun and her husband, Chunya Rinpoche. Chunya Rinpoche. So exactly. they are my teachers. Wonderful. Yeah, they so were amazing. Also to see like a yogi and yogini, a couple mm. as your teacher, it's like more, you know, the feeling of family. Yes. You know, you receive teachings yeah. from the father yeah. and then you receive the kind of affection from the mother. Absolutely. Sometimes I also imagine like Mila Ripa, you know, when yeah. Mila Ripa was trained by Marpa. So Marpa was the like tough teacher, the tough guru. You yeah, know, but then his that. wife was the... <laughs> his wife was so sweet to yeah. him. Yeah. So I think it's like a family, you know? Yeah. When we grow up, we need a father and a mother. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I think also in the tantric Buddhism, it's, mm. it is important we have both father and mother. Yeah. So we have father tantra and mother tantra. Right. Father Tantra as a teacher is a man, and Mother Tantra as a teacher is a man. Right. You know? So there the needs tantra, to be more. Exactly. Yeah. Tantra says Father Tantra, Mother Tantra, yeah. but teachers are all men. Yeah. So that's why this, I never thought these things, but then later, you know, I received these teachings. You know, sometimes you just reflect about your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. I, I often think, like, I thought maybe if my teacher, the nun, mm. if, if she, if she was a monk, maybe I escaped from him, you know. Mm, but if she's a nun, you can't. If she's yeah, a nun, true. you know, you yeah, you you, not, you mm -hmm. feel like her yeah. affection. You, you feel love. responsibility of it, a different exactly. kind. Yeah. And it would be so skillful. And first she said, if you want to really, you know, study and practice, you should become a monk. I said, okay. And then, you know, I was in a college student and for one month in my head, you know, I, okay, mm -hmm. I'm a monk, you know, mm -hmm. I tried to behave like a monk. And mm -hmm. then in one month, I realized, I said, it's impossible yeah. uh -huh. because I want to continue my medicine journey. Yeah. I want to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then monk, I'm sure for some people it's possible, but in mm -hmm. my case, I thought, okay, it's impossible. Yeah, so I went back and I told the truth. I told mm -hmm. my teacher, I said, it's difficult for me. Mm -hmm. I cannot become a monk because of my desire. It would limit you. Mostly. Yeah, yeah, this and that. And then she said, ah, okay. She said, if you have enough courage, yeah, you stay mm -hmm. as a lay person and yeah. you practice too. That's it. And then she gave me many practices. That's right? it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the way actually like, uh, yeah, receiving a teaching from mother mm. and you feel the, you know, unconditional love and mm -hmm. affection. Yeah. So at the end, even she insults you, you know. <laughs> yeah, then you don't, yeah. Exactly. Really so in this way, you're right. Exactly. If So if those nuns, for example, the, the I mean, Ching Palm was trying to empower them to mm -hmm. become, receive this full ordination, if they can actually develop the qualities where they have the confidence to become great teachers. And if those as, as trade teachers, if they can help to train a younger generation of even male monastics, mm -hmm. I think the male monastics will benefit tremendously because mm -hmm. I feel sometimes the overly male monastic environment is so exclusively male that a lot of the, you know, the monks who graduate from that tradition, they actually have no real skill or ability to interact with, uh, the, with, with the female side of reality. And as a result, so many of the kind of problems that have resulted, you know, within the traditions, you know, in karma, you know, Kagyu tradition especially, is because there's no female presence within the, the whole monastic training. Mm -hmm. And so then well, this yeah. can lead to confusion. Mm -hmm. um, even for the 
the holders of the lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, a little bit more female energy in there is to guide them, instruct them, and uh, would, I think, be very beneficial. Well, like uh, when we were last year in Bhutan in the Vajrayana conference, mm. actually, you mentioned, you said, how come there are so few yogis and yoginis? Mm. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's true. Like Bhutan is a Drupa Kaju. Yeah. And it is a, it's probably the main like Vajrayana country in the mm. world mm. now. And when there was a Vajrayana conference, there are many monks. Yeah, monks, <laughs> you know, and a few nuns, yeah. there are many monks. Yeah. And there are not so many, yeah, Nagpas or Nagmas, yogis yeah. and yeah. yoginis. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe the Nagpas and the yogis, yoginis are not so academic or not, they are not well trained or they are not invited. Yeah. But then I, I realized in Bhutan, they call it the Nagpa, they call Gomchinpas, you yeah, know, like great yeah. meditators, right. this and that. So they yeah. even don't use that word much, you know, the right. Nagpas. Right, true. Gomchin, they mm -hmm. use it a lot more. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I, maybe they use that, but not so many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. So that's why I think in generally, uh, we know like there are many, how do you say, uh, hidden yogi, mm. yogis and yoginis, mm. you know, mm. because basically all uh, tantric Buddhist practitioners mm. or if somebody who received empowerment, Anuttara Yoga Tantra empowerment. Yeah. Actually, many people ask me, oh, how can I become a Nagpa or Nag, you know, mm. Nagma? Mm. How, I want to become a yogi or yogini. How can I? I, I love because once you received Anuttara Yoga empowerment, yeah, and you are, yeah. that <laughs> is the process of becoming a yogi and yogini too, mm. right? Yeah. You are saying, I promise my master, I'll do the, you know, practice mm -hmm. this and that. Mm -hmm. So once, if you receive the empowerment, you are, you know, Nenjurpa mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. You are the practitioner already and yeah. you have the right and, you know, you receive the teachings and so on. Mm. So many people, they don't know these things. Mm. That's why I think it's very important to bring the awareness. You know? Yeah. I think it's an important time. Yeah, very yeah. true. And that's the beauty of the empowerments because they're empowerments that because they're so structured and the, you know, the vows aren't things to make people feel, you know, terrified if they break the vows and all of that, mm -hmm. but they're actually, they, they, they set, they, they're giving you the map, you could say, of the, uh, of the tantric culture and the tantric worldview. And so they can become a way of empowering people to really recognize what it means to be a yogi yogini. And the most important part of that, of course, is that every action you undertake is with compassion, you know, for the benefit of all beings. It's not like some, you know, path of becoming a sorcerer where you <laughs> develop, you know, superhuman qualities and you do what you want. You know, it's really how do we um, develop these capacities within a, with the ultimate intention of bringing benefit to, mm -hmm. to all of life. Um, so I think that's the that, that to me is the beauty of the tantric culture in the in the Vajrayana tradition at mm -hmm. least. So do you think yoga is important or yogis and yoginis are important? Well, yogis and yoginis are important because if they're if you don't have the people practicing the tradition, then you <laughs> yeah. can have it in a book or <laughs> exactly. no, no yeah. power. And as we know, if naljur, if yoga is really the naljur, it's the natural state. It's according to someone's capacity and their inclination, their their orientation, whether they want to take on the really strong yogic physical practices, intensive breathing, all of that, or if they want to, you know, take a more ati level approach where, you know, it can be done, as you said, through mantra, it can be done through the different approaches, I think. And that the beauty of it is that you can be yogi yogini without having to necessarily you know, you, in other words, you don't have any excuse. <laughs> mm -hmm. In other words, it's not like if you can't do some complicated, like on the cover of your book, you know, where you have all these uh, yogic postures, you know, it doesn't mean like those are, those are auxiliary, as you know, they're, they're yeah, auxiliary yeah, yeah. practices, yes, they're yes, yes. enhancement practices, they can remove obstacles, yeah, and they yeah. can bring when, about a heightened uh, realization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, when we talk about yoga, and yoga reverses yogis and yoginis is like, medical science and doctors right mm, yeah yeah <laughs> medical science is important but we need good doctors right too. exactly otherwise <laughs> yeah, the yeah. science is just kind of latent uh, exactly. potentiality yeah, yeah. without yeah, yeah. anybody exactly. to practice it. so that's why today our discussion is about the doctors mm, yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. doctors are important so yogis and yoginis are important yeah yeah and there are male doctors female doctors you know it, it's very interesting actually the um, coming back the how do you say women's force because 
like I, I don't know, like four or five uh, decades mm -hmm. ago. Mm. The, in the West, the most of doctors are male doctors. There are mm. very few female doctors. True. And today yeah. there are more female doctors yeah. than male doctors. Exactly. So in yoga tradition is the same. You yeah. Know? yeah. Originally there are many yoginis and then there are more yogis. Mm -hmm. And now I think it's a, you know, you know, like you said, that the yeah, we're coming back into a, the, the next circle. cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are more like female practitioners. And even world leaders too. You know, we're seeing more and more female world leader. I mean, hopefully in America too, we'll see a female president before too long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think the men have. Uh... Okay, okay. You wish more female politicians and I wish more female doctors and female yoginis. Well, well no, I wish for the whole there, thing. There was an interesting research there. You know, the research is talking about the doctors, mm. male doctors and female doctors. Mm -hmm. And they said with female doctors, there are more for patient, more survival chance, mm. you know? Like mm -hmm. females, because there's a nurturing quality, exactly, yeah, nurturing yeah, sure. connection. Yeah. So they yeah. treat, you know, the patient. Yeah. I don't know. Well, see, this is why we as need their family members. Yeah. You well, know? this is why we need women in politics, because mm -hmm. they will heal the political structure, which has become so completely materialistic, governed by corporations. Okay. The feminine energy can heal. It's a bringing a doctor's. Yeah, that's. True. And you're that's bringing true. compassion into politics. If you don't have that, mm -hmm. then politics will only serve the leaders. That's it will true. never yeah, serve yeah. the masses. I think yeah, yogis and yoginis, they should discuss and talk about politics yeah. they should be involved in politics too yeah but for me i always say i have zero political cells <laughs> yeah. well, we're going. we don't yeah. have that yeah, 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 um, yeah. orientation but if people do i think it's a great yeah, yeah, yeah when yeah. i think if buddha was born today he might not have given up his palace and his role as a he might have skillfully integrated and found mm -hmm. a way you know he could have uh, you know you can do a lot if you were in a position of of, mm -hmm. of influence yeah yeah right. and also the case of buddha actually it's interesting when buddha you know he escaped from the palace mm. and there are many stories are saying he was supported by his aunt and his wife mm. You know, like two yoginis. Yoginis behind, yeah, yeah behind, behind the great the, man. <laughs> exactly, behind a man. Yeah. And they really helped him, you know. Yeah, yeah. And otherwise, maybe he had obstacles too, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the hidden then, life of Yasudara. Yeah, yeah. And then many people are saying, okay, the Tibetan yogic, you know, tantric tradition, maybe not something to do with Buddhism, you know, more like Hindus, this and that. Mm. But if you look at the Buddha story itself, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Buddha had. Buddha was a human and he had a lay person's experiences. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. He, yeah, he had wealth, he was a prince and he was even married and mm -hmm. he was a father. Yeah. So somehow the lay person's experience, he always had, he had all of them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he didn't renounce them until he'd actually fully experienced the whole mm -hmm. totality of, yeah, yeah. of existence. And then it became a natural mm -hmm. kind of... Um, actually a natural kind of expansion because he the last thing he had to explore was actually the solid the life of solitude and meditation because mm -hmm. otherwise it was life of yeah, constant yeah. entertainment mm -hmm. so yeah. okay so yeah. any last words about the yogis and yoginis i think we covered the whole thing yeah from doctors to politicians <laughs> to to <laughs> hidden yogis, yoginis and, and yogi. uh, the importance of actually um, yeah. bringing the qualities of yogis and yoginis whether it's visible or whether it's invisible but if the real quality of the yogi yogini is the natural state, the nulju, uh, mm -hmm. bringing that into all fields of activity in human life can only be beneficial. So, so I think it's a wonderful thing. It might seem so exotic from another part of the world in Tibet, but the spirit behind it, the, the skills, the, the, the knowledge, the medical traditions, the yogic uh, practices, all of these have just as much applicability in you know, the Western world mm -hmm. today. Yeah, yeah, in modern world, I think the yogi culture is more integrative, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah more integrative. So I just want to give a last mm. example. Mm. Here in Italy, in Tuscany, there's a big uh, Buddhist group, Lama Zopa group, mm. Lama Tsongkhaba Institute. Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, many people, they receive very intensive Buddhist educations, both Sutra and Tantra. I think most of them, they are lay people. Mm -hmm. mm. So, but then also they have a monastic, uh, how do you say, group too, you know, mm -hmm. so like, actually it's a nice, it's a one kind of Buddhist group, there's yeah. lay people and there's yeah, monastic. monastic, 
and they are kind of living together, you know. Mm, good. It's not one is better than others, no, kind no. of this harmony. Which is really how it was yeah, supposed yeah, it, to be in the beginning. Right, it, right, exactly. Right. This is how it's supposed to be in general, how do you say, like tantric Buddhist mm. centers are, right? Mm. So there are some of them, they are so monastic and they are mm. against the mm. lay people's tradition. And then some are so much like lay people and then they are yeah. against the monastery, yeah. you know, so. But here there was a natural integration. Yeah, yeah, natural integration. I think that's very important. Beautiful. And in generally this uh, yogic culture or tradition, I think it's much easier to integrate in society, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it sort of fits mm -hmm. with our the modern uh, Western. So let world. let let hope there will be more yogis and yoginis, and, definitely, and yogis and yogini teachers and so mm -hmm. on. So the yogic tradition will spread. Beautiful to benefit all others. Yes, absolutely. and so this is yeah. Today's our talk is about the yogis and yoginis, and uh, probably we don't have time for answering questions. It, it's a, just a very general like conversation. Yeah. So hopefully in future we can talk more things. Yeah, and then people tune in for the next one where we talk more about what yeah. do yogis, what do yogis and yoginis do? They do it, yoga so, and they do and what is yoga. Wednesday mean? we are coming back again, so we are going to <laughs> we are going to talk about Tibetan yoga, you know. So and the Nezhang, which is sort of the entry level. Uh, <laughs> the entry level. <laughs> of the Tibetan yeah. yoga. So we are talking yeah the principle and practices. Yeah. And uh, this is his new book. It's an amazing book. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I love this. I think it's one of the greatest book to really, you mm. know, represent Tibetan yoga for, Thank the, you. Pub Great. for the public. Uh, and like this book too of yours, you know, which also just came out recently. It's yeah. really like a... That's a very practical part. Practical, because it's a self-healing yoga, mm -hmm. which I think is... Uh, so we'll so, look at all of that from yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. diversity so of yoga. On practice. Wednesday, we are going to talk about uh, Tibetan yoga, you know, mm -hmm. what Tibetan yoga is. And mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully, see you guys there. Thank you. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.